So, Mitch, it, I guess it looks like you also did not make it to IAEM, the International Association of Emergency Management conference. No, they, w- they wouldn't take me. <laughs> yeah. They were like, they listened to the show and then they were like, no <laughs> way. Like, you no, sorry, me, man. No. Have you been living vicariously through friends and colleagues that have gone, though? Like, Social media tweets yeah, from IAEM? I've been, every night I've been looking at hashtag IAEM and it's... Some pretty cool stuff. Is it? Is there any? I haven't been. Is there any like serial drama? Are there like relationships being made and broken? <laughs> and are people crying into I'm their margaritas? I'm sure there are some quote relationships, yes, being made at an emergency <laughs> management conference. But you know, I went last year, and uh, and Jordan, my wife, went too. Yeah. And you know, she was pregnant at the time, and she had incredible morning sickness. Oh. So our romantic IEM adventure was basically her like vomiting uh, nice. in the, in the hotel room uh, night after night. That's great. It was really good. It was our own serial drama that we were doing. <laughs> That's great. Maybe next year we can do IEM. Oh, maybe next year. Yeah. No, we'll rule it. We'll like um, we'll like photobomb IEM. We'll go into every session and just like you know like Ask jump up behind the, the one presenters. person that asks all the long annoying questions <laughs> that are really comments. Um, excuse me. Uh, I got more of a comment. Yeah, that's right. And uh, when I was working uh, fire jumping in, uh, in the 70s, you know, we just didn't do ICS right. that way. In the, uh, in that. I'm from New York City. Can <laughs> I have a comment? Yeah, don't. No, that's as soon as you say that, essentially, I think yeah. you're done. <laughs> All right, we have a great episode, and I, you know, no offense to our previous guests, but <laughs> this is probably the smartest, most intelligent. Uh, That's right. Academically, that you know, she has more more degrees than anyone we've had on, <laughs> and right. also is a woman of action. Yeah, and so I think that's that's impressive in its, its own right. Pretty incredible. So let me read some of the bio, and then we'll we'll introduce introduce her. So Nicolette Louis Saint is the executive director of Healthcare Ready. Prior to this position, she served as a foreign affairs officer at the U.S. Department of State in the Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs. So. As the lead officer for health, intellectual property, and trade issues, she advised State Department on issues related to public health, technology transfer, and biotechnology. Um, She also worked uh, the Ebola response of 2014, served as the senior advisor to the State Department Special Coordinator for Ebola, so did a lot of uh, really amazing work. Just to mention some of the degrees... uh, a Bachelor's of Science in Chemical <laughs> Engineering and Biological Sciences from Carnegie Mellon, a PhD in Pharmacology and Molecular Sciences. I'm not even sure what that is. It is incredible. Well, no, this is my, and I think Nicolette's like rolling her eyes. Like, <laughs> really, guys, are you going to talk through my entire yeah, academic read history? This whole thing. Specialized in Chemical Pharmacology. What is that? I don't know. We're going to find out from Johns Hopkins. Uh, she completed a postdoc at, J- at John Hopkins. So, so which leads me, I guess, to my first most important question, Nicolette. As a pharmacologist, can you make your own drugs? Absolutely. Whoa! Oh, this see? is a friend that we need. <laughs> that's right. Especially in uh, if we lived in Colorado, if only yes. you know. Well, those, that's that's great, actually. Those long responses. This is the perfect person to have in your EOC. Uh, Nicolette, welcome. Thank you for coming on. Hey guys, thanks for having me. So I guess just to start with what, you you know, you have this amazing background in science and how did you transition to, to public health, emergency response, emergency management? What, why the, the shift? Um, so the not so glamorous answer, um, I actually went into chemical engineering because I was fascinated with explosives and, my it freaked my dad out but i basically became a chemical engineer because i was like i want to learn how bombs work and how to be able to do that um and so (laughs) um once i realized that that was not as fun as i thought it was going to be um i started to think about all of the things that chemical engineers do and create and realized that it really came back to understanding how the human body worked, which is why I just ended up doing a dual degree in biological sciences. Um, so for me, a lot of my interest has been kind of science as applied to humans and, you know, general populations. So it kind of, you know, from my vantage point, it kind of became a natural progression to, 
to go from doing the clinical research and the pharmacology and looking at infectious diseases at the bench and in academia into thinking about disease outbreaks and disasters and kind of more the public health side of things. Um, so, so, so I don't want to my toes, but that's how I got there. I don't want to go into too much like ISIS territory here, but can you make your own bombs? Then, if you so can make your own drugs, I can you make your own bombs? I will say that I have three sisters, and every single one of them has had a prank played on them with an explosive of some sort. <laughs> oh, so. That is amazing. <laughs> That's great. You're applying. It has happened. Yes, you're applying the research into real day, you know, situations. That's great. Exactly. I, um, I you may be the most dangerous person that we've had on this yeah, uh, show. Yeah, actually a little scared now. <laughs> yeah, um, but we're we're emergency managers. I mean, the best this. prank, honestly, was like instant mashed potatoes exploding everywhere. Yeah, so we can talk about that offline, Ooh. but. That's okay. So nobody Pretty lost good. any eyebrows or fingers. <laughs> no eyebrows. Except it's a potato. lot of mashed potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna. It's gonna take me a while to recover from that. Yes. I think. But how do you um, transition from that to <laughs> Puerto Rico? Well, we're gonna be sad. We're just gonna. We're gonna go from happy to sad, like That's in right. five seconds. That's like. Right. Bring it down. So, uh, you know, our last episode with Jeff, we we called "What the F Just Happened," and then right before we did that episode, Maria hit, mm-hmm. and and the world mm-hmm. just got like categorically worse right after that. So mm-hmm. we want to bring Nicolette in because um, obviously, you know, she works in healthcare ready. She's a specialist in these clinical issues and that's a big part of the impact, but we're going to try and cover the whole gamut of, of what Maria's done. So I'm just going to frame it for a second, Nicolette, and, uh, and kind of lay out this massive thing. So this is uh, an incredibly powerful storm uh, that hit Puerto Rico. And let's be clear, Irma had already hit Puerto Rico, came, went just north of the island. 60,000 people were still without electricity from Irma when, uh, when Maria hit. Full-on uh, Category 5, well, it hit it as a Category 4, I guess, you know, right at the edge, uh, on September 20th. Fifth strongest storm ever to hit the country. Strongest storm to hit Puerto Rico in 80 years. Um, you know, massive, still debated death toll. It's more than a, I mean, more than a month out, like a month and a half out, a month and a half plus. And there's still people, lots of people without power, lots of people without water, massive, massive, um, impact, uh, to the Island. Anything, what, what do you feel like have been the sort of the biggest impacts that you've seen in your work, uh, over there? Um, Well, one of the things that you just said that's really interesting is we talk about the power loss as if it's stagnant and and almost as if kind of there was an Irma hit and there was a loss of power and then Maria hit and then pretty much the rest of the island went out and it's been kind of a gradual uptick. But there was actually a major power outage last week and there was a major power outage yesterday as well. So even the parts of the island that have been reconnected are still in danger of of having intermittent power at best. So um, to me, that's really jumped out as something that um, we have to keep our eye on because, you know, having the parts of the grid restored right now isn't a guarantee that these facilities and these um, homes are going to stay connected to the grid. Yeah, and it's interesting, I you know, apart from the just uh, the, the the frustration and the difficulty it is to, in this day and age to live without power. I I didn't realize this, but I read that the Puerto Rico is home to more than a hundred drug and medical device manufacturers. So they mm-hmm. produce about forty billion worth of pharmaceuticals for the U.S. market, and we're actually starting to see impacts in that market in the U.S. from the lack of you know the ability of these companies to either minimally produce or still not be able to produce because of because of the power so we're seeing public health implications from an infrastructure outage yeah and you know that that's been um driving me pretty crazy lately because um i will say that um a lot of those companies are our partners or our members but something else to consider aside from manufacturing is also distribution And there are distribution facilities that are in Puerto Rico that are responsible for distributing something like 85% of all of the medicines to the Caribbean. So we're not just talking about Puerto Rico. We're talking about the entire greater and lesser Antilles having supply from those warehouses and facilities that are on that island. So 
you know, that's just a different part of the chain that we honestly do not talk about and do not think about even in the U.S. mainland enough. Um, I've always referred to the distributors as the heroes of the supply chain. You start to give them credit and they just like shy away in the corner. But thinking about how those warehouses are going to stay connected, how those medicines are going to retain their quality um, and then get distributed out to the rest of the Caribbean has been a major concern in addition to thinking about the manufacturing that has to happen of the medicines and the devices on the island. Here's my question. Can you, Nicolette, make enough drugs personally to make up the difference as a pharmacologist? Can we... Can can we figure out a way for me to just have like five factories to myself for That's a right. week? And and you can use your bombs to distribute them. I, no. I think we're on to something here. Let's uh yeah. yeah. I, I feel... let's, let's brainstorm that. <laughs> I think I think that um I just sorry, I got these images of pills being projected by exploding mashed potatoes all around the Caribbean. If the NSA is not listening to this <laughs> podcast now, we've mentioned bombs, drugs, what else? That's right, I cyber think. tech, cyber tech. Pharmacology. Russian hackers, yeah. Russian hackers. Yeah. But I never really thought about the interdependency of the Caribbean is really important here because Puerto Rico is in some respects the hub that keeps the rest of the Caribbean t- together, right? And so right. now they've right. all been hit by all of these different storms. And and you're saying that the mm-hmm. Puerto Rico impacts are impacting the, the recovery of the whole the whole region. Absolutely. And for me, as, especially as somebody with roots in the Caribbean, my whole family's from the Caribbean. My parents were born in the Caribbean. Um, I'm used to hurricane season. We get it. We know how this works. Um, and it's been really impactful on the responses in Dominica, even thinking about um, the U- U.S. Virgin Islands, the British Virgin Islands, understanding what's happening with distribution into and out of Puerto Rico becomes really critical for those other islands. St. Kitts is still largely without power as well. So, you know, when you're just thinking about what's happening through the Irma and Maria affected islands, you got to think about how central Puerto Rico is for so much of their public health. And, you know, to be clear, even Dominica, like 95% of the housing on Dominica was destroyed by Maria. I mean, I think we're right. in this crazy world where we've already moved on to the next disaster, right? We've had shootings since then. We've had, you know, Asian news. We've had, you know, crazy things happening all over, the, yeah. all over the world. Right. And, uh, you know, most of the Caribbean is still really ravaged by these, these storms. Right. Yes. Yeah. I have family um, that actually made it up. Um, extended family that, you know, elderly folks that were in Dominica, were in Barbuda, um, that couldn't be found for, you know, a week or two and flew into JFK literally with the clothes on their back and like an army duffel bag. I don't know where they got it from, but, you know, and, and that's how they made it into New York. And, and now they're just staying with our, our family that's up there. Um, and that's a lot of folks' realities. But we're, we're in a totally different space right now. For Even for us, you know, my brain is still in August. I'm still kind of processing Harvey, trying to figure out what we need to do in Texas and Florida right. um, based off of Harvey and Irma. And then Maria comes. So we, we're in a, a totally different emergency management environment where we have to figure out how to not get exhausted by all of this stuff, but figure out how to balance our attention and also balance our, our focus on recovery in a lot of different places at the same time. So what was the emergency management culture like in in Puerto Rico? I, th- this was an extremely devastating sp- storm, so there's no way you could have prepared enough for something like this. But is 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 hurricane preparedness something that 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 folks take seriously? Is it um, do you think enough was done before the storm to to prepare for for impacts like this? Um so I think the, the the reality from my vantage point is that Irma probably saved a lot of lives hmm. because Irma happening, how it did and when it did, really helped folks, even I think at the PREPA level, the emergency management level, to really take stock and think about kind of what, what they have just happened and how to prepare for Maria. Generally, I think 
culture in the Caribbean um, as kind of dis- natural disaster prone islands to prepare. There's a recognition that you have to be ready, you have to be prepared to go a week or two without power, you got to have food, you got to have water. But the medicine side of things, the healthcare delivery side, very different. We see that even here. There'll be folks who can literally feed their entire families for a month and not have a refill of their medicines. That's right. Yep. Well, so let's talk about that response then some, and maybe we'll start on the healthcare side. Uh, you know, and this is a little tough for us. I guess I'm going to be candid about it because we are really pro emergency managers on this show. And I think the, the emergency managers okay. are great. And in Puerto Rico, they've done a great job. They're working hard, but from the outside, this response, I guess, doesn't seem to be as strong as what we would have liked to see. And, and there were some strange things about it. And, and so I guess mm-hmm. I, I just want to sort of start with just sort of asking you to walk us through what, what you saw happen in response and maybe in the healthcare response, particularly uh, in the first couple of weeks after Maria hit. Yeah. And, and, you know, to that point, it's, it's hard for me too, because these are, these are colleagues, these are friends um, and, and agencies and offices that I have tremendous respect for. Um, and still, you know, really respect, but it's been hard to, to, to really line, you know, line it all up. So from my vantage point, I think the, you know, I'm not going to go through it in the interest of time, but we have to keep in context how we were all feeling after Harvey and Irma. Um, I mean, I thought my team was joking when I walked out of our emergency operations center and came back in and they said, so Maria's coming. I thought it was a joke because we were 20 something days in and now we're getting ready for another category five. So that's where we all were. So it is to me really important to talk about the fact that there aren't enough emergency managers in this field. We just need more people. And, you know, FEMA, HHS, DHS, that's no different. So they're coming into Maria completely fatigued. I I don't think that's an exaggeration. But then also trying to figure out the logistics of Maria. Every emergency is, as you guys know, a massive logistical operation. And this one was no different. Um, A lot of the questions about Maria, actually watching it go through the Lesser Antilles and devastate those those other islands, a lot of those questions started with how do you preposition knowing full well that a storm of this size and this magnitude is going to come in and probably destroy any ships that we try to preposition before the storm? Right. Where, you where do really, you pre? I mean, could you, you even preposition right. in this? You probably couldn't even no. preposition in the, in the southeastern U.S. because it might – there exactly and remember when we were looking at the projections of maria we were thinking it was going to go all the way up to north carolina so with that projection in mind it was it was pretty clear that we couldn't really line anything up off off of the east coast because it would have been at risk so that's one part we have you know an emergency management infrastructure that's stretched between Harvey and Irma, and now they're getting ready for Maria with the current projections. Um, And then the storm actually hit. So there were some conversations about what it looked like to be ready for it. I do think there um, there was enough effort put into working with the state and local government. There was a recognition that the governor's office was beginning to, to get ready. But at the same time, I don't think that we knew enough about in Puerto Rico and that's you know just my perspective but I don't I don't think we had enough insight to be able to predict with any level of intelligence kind of what the anticipated impacts were going to be so then we waited out the storm and really the first few days were in the dark in every way conceivable we had no power we had no comms there was no internet the governor's office website wasn't working because the servers were down. There were no phones. There was an emergency operations center, but it couldn't fully connect to FEMA. The folks that were on the ground were working with each other, but it was really, really hard to get any messages to D.C. or, you know, just out 
period. Um, and so a lot of it was how do we go to our old school methods, who has a sat phone, how do we just start getting satellite phones down there? Um, and, and really, from my perspective, it took about a solid week hmm. to get any level of routine communications. Um, so while there was the EOC set up and while, you know, there were some other pieces that were moving, until that communication line was, um, was restored and we were able to really get visibility from a number of different folks, right? So for us on the healthcare side, we're talking FEMA, HHS, the governor's office, but we're also talking the hospital association. I needed to know from my vantage point how the dialysis centers were doing, how the pharmacies were doing. Um, I needed to know what the manufacturers were seeing, um, what the distributors were going through, when they needed to make their resupplies, what the community health centers were doing. It took at least 10 days to have that picture. So let's, so, talk, let's talk about yeah. that because – we're. I think one of the points you're making is we were really at sort of bread and butter, sort of prehistoric emergency management conditions in those first few days. Yeah. So what? What in particular? And so let's just focus on comms and logistics. Just you know, straight up old school comms and logistics. Um, mm -hmm. What? Why over the past ten, fifteen years of working on these things, it it. I guess my worry is, or my questions are, A, are we too over-reliant on the fancy technology now? Did we de de learn that lesson? And B, aren't satellite phones fancy technology? I guess I just backed myself into a corner there. <laughs> Cause Your circular I, reasoning Well, is uh, right, disturbing. because it used to be sat phones were fancy, but now nobody uses them because okay. the satellite network's degraded. So I, I guess let They're me just... They're still really expensive. Yeah. yeah. Is, is that what it is? Well, like, I think they were used. Go ahead, uh, Nicolette. So, I, I, I mean, I remember being at the emergency management meetings and hearing, um, you know, some of the more seasoned, we'll say, emergency managers talking to me about ham radio. I like seasoned. And you, you mean, it's okay. You mean like grizzled and old. It's fine. Do they have mustaches and pot bellies? <laughs> Don't make hey, fun of I'm, I'm going with seasoned because I'm not getting in trouble. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I still need these folks tomorrow morning. With paprika morning to and chili out. powder. <laughs> we, we said it, not you. That's right. <laughs> so uh yeah you know i remember hearing about sat phones and like us still needing to do these plans about what happens in a massive power outage the national level exercise this year was around a massive power outage we still weren't ready so in some ways yes are we are we too dependent on technology yeah but but let's be honest for a second a lot of this had to do with being not in the U.S. mainland and disconnected via comms because there is no way that we would have had this level of visibility if we could have had trucks going in and folks trying to trying to get in on the roads or you know via helicopter. We we were having conversations about airdrops two weeks in. That's not what we would have done if it was on the mainland. So. Absolutely. So, Are we too dependent on technology? Yeah, that's a, that's a conversation we should have. But how we do responses in the territories is a bigger one to me. So, so, um, so, okay, comms, set phones don't really work. Totally believe in ham radios. I think we should all get, we should actually get a Duke's ham radio <clears> license. <throat> That'd be good. And I don't know if it's that sat phones don't work. I think FEMA, one of the first things they did was deliver caches of sat phones because that was the easiest way to get communication well what was there. your because my experience with sat you phones have to is get them out there you, right you, but even yeah. if they're out there you have to like stand on a hill in the right weather conditions and like lean to the side 45 no, degrees not do you think just so gonna, yeah you just have line of sight i thought and this is something to follow and i know i'm being really wonky is that i thought the satellite network uh, the global star or the had had degraded over the past 10 years like I some of the satellites know. had gone out of service yeah, I'm not sure. all right i'll let that so one here's what i can tell you i do know that um very 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 early on, even around Irma time, um, some of our telecoms private sector partners were asking us about um, their own business continuity and whether or not they needed to prioritize some of our facilities because they knew that they were critical for public health. Um, and they were like, yeah, we're doing a whole bunch of stuff to make sure that the sat satellite phones can work. So they were already thinking about it. Okay. Um, and in a lot of their restoration plans, they actually were, were making sure that the phones would have worked and then starting to infuse 
um, massive donations of phones that were programmed and set into facilities. So once the phones are there and they're they're programmed and they're ready, they're good. But it took a really long time to get those satellite phones there. Mm. So, so maybe let's talk about the other aspect of that, the one-two punch, which is the distribution strategy. Because I, I think a lot of the, uh, the 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 press was about the issue of it being an island and not on the mainland. But a lot of the sort of the journals and, and sit rep things were about bottlenecks at the ports themselves. So I wonder if you could dig into some of those early day distribution problems and, and lay out what you think the bottlenecks were. So, um, I, so I think a lot of those bottlenecks, um, are, you know, th- those are a function of being on an island. So things having to come into a port and then getting trucked, um, you also have the fact that a lot of the folks that are responding to the disaster are affected by the disaster. We all know that that's the worst case scenario. You don't want the people who are affected to also be the ones who are in the trenches having to do the work. And when the truckers that are needed to be able to truck things out of the port are also dealing with their own families or not able to get their own gasoline to be able to, <laughs> to operate their vehicles to get to work, um, there, it's not it's not going to happen. Um, so those are some of the things that if we let's say this was Harvey in Texas, we would be, we would have had fleets of trucks coming in, right? So that that just wasn't logistically that just wasn't feasible because we were we were thinking about Puerto Rico, um, and you know thinking about an island. So that was definitely a part of the bottleneck was just the trucks, just. How are trucks going to move? Is there gasoline for these trucks? Which gas stations are with power and operational so that folks can get gasoline? And then how do you get the truckers who are also impacted into these trucks, fueled, and then on the roads? Like those are those are all questions that um, seem really basic but are very complicated in the absence of communication and power. Now add the layer onto this of this is a natural disaster, what's going on in the roads? Which roads are passable, which ones aren't? In the absence of communication, how do you figure that out? How do you navigate that and give a trucker the guidance on which roads they should take and which routes they should go with in the absence of, you know, phones that are working or power and being worried about whether or not they're going to have enough gas? So... All of those logistics, those very basic logistics that, you know, we kind of take for granted when we're not in that scenario around where do we get our fuel? How, you know, who's actually manning these, you know, these operations? How are people going to be able to get to work and then, you know, do their jobs? How do they get the routes? Um, All of that information was just so critical and we didn't have it. So uh, then... Let me, you know, two things that have been bandied around a lot uh, about the slowness of the response were the Jones Act thing. So the Jones Act is this act that that means if you're shipping to Puerto Rico, you need to use, you know, American uh, flagged ships and and uh, and people. Yeah, I think they have to come from a certain U.S. port, right? They can't. Right. Directly to. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess. It's the whole thing. So, yeah. and and then the other thing was about CG funding. Was this the delay in the administration um, giving CG funding, which is Stafford Act in, uh, infrastructure funding, as opposed to public assistance? And the claim was, well, it took longer to give that that infrastructure funding to Puerto Rico. So, I guess my question is, from watching these distribution strategy things, do you think either of those things made a difference on the ground in the slowness of this? Did the Jones Act matter? Did the fact that the feds took a couple extra weeks to commit CG funding? Funding, do these things matter to the response? The funding always matters. Um, the Jones Act, I'm not so convinced. Um, the Jones Act, in some ways, so in some ways, it was actually better to not waive it to be able to control things at the port. Oh, yeah. Because it didn't actually change the relief that we needed to get in, getting in. You know what I mean? So instead of having to worry about um, any, you know, any 
carriers being able to come in, you had a little bit more control under the Jones Act. Did it really change the scope of the response? No. Did I personally, as a you know, as a, an e- emergency manager, find that we weren't able to get things in? No. Um, we moved a lot of product. We worked with a lot of companies and a lot of folks that moved things. We were not impacted whether or not the Jones Act was waived or not. So for the period of time that it was waived, it, for us it was the exact same as when it wasn't. Yeah, but it seemed like a we lot do of know that there were hiccups. Yeah, I'm sorry. To get... it, it seemed like it's... supplies didn't have a problem getting into the port, but the the problem was really getting from the port out into yeah uh, the rest of the island. We're, we're so... And it was the trucking issue. So that once the trucking issue was resolved, um, that that largely went away. So. For us, um, on the healthcare side, when we had deliveries coming in, um, the biggest question was not, is there a truck? It was, is that truck gassed? Because it's going to take two days to make sure that the truck has enough gasoline. But as long as there's a trucker and gasoline, we were good. Mm -hmm. So that was actually the big, big issue about why things were being stuck. It was more this question of, are we are we making sure that the truckers as employees have what they need to be able to come in to work in you know in the aftermath of a major storm? Well, so let's just follow that all the way through. So the other thing we got about distribution um, was the was this last mile problem, right? Which was that you were able yeah. to find a truck, you had fuel in the truck, but at least the way commodity distribution worked initially, it was re- this regional model where it was it didn't go directly to towns because you know, you're trying to work with local authorities. And so you had regional distribution centers and the, the, the local towns and villages were supposed to send folks to those places to get those materials. I don't know if that was a yeah. medication issue as, as much, but but did you see that strategy working and, and was that successful or should, should that last mile distribution have been uh, solved another way? Um, I will say we didn't do that. <laughs> Um, but, um, and I, I can explain why we didn't, why we didn't use that strategy for, for on the medicine side, um, and kind of what our philosophy is, but the challenge is that, you know, last mile is a problem everywhere. And oftentimes we think about the last mile as being a challenge, um, only in developing countries or only in really resource poor environments. The reality is that the last mile is hard everywhere. It's hard in the U.S. There, there are challenges the deeper you go into communities, and sometimes that's just logistics. It's understanding going on this road versus this road on a blue sky day. So when you have commodities being dropped off, the idea of having these central points is making it easier to be able to have some sorts of central nodes and then hoping that communication channels and then, um, you know, other other modes can kind of get that um, commodities um, moved and penetrated deeper into those communities. But it's hard. Um, our philosophy is to get the normal supply chain to the best of our ability right. up and running um, with the belief that the normal supply chain, because it's been operating, is always going to figure out a way to be more efficient than a disaster supply chain, which has not been an operation in the community will be. And so our focus was how do we look at where the dialysis centers are? Our roots are in pharmacies. So we're looking at the pharmacies, the chains, and the community pharmacies, and the clinics and hospitals. And we're trying to figure out where they are, what they need, and how do we support our partners who are on the ground doing this distribution in getting the medicine and the medical supplies to them in those facilities. And it was hard for a few weeks to to consistently be able to do that. One of the things that we saw, which was actually, you know, from my vantage point, crazy, we saw paper orders being ran from hospitals to distribution facilities. Mm -hmm. Just think about that. When was the last time a paper order for anything came from a hospital to a major distributor? Um, but that's what we saw happening. Um, and we, we recognized that, you know, we had to do things like call pharmacies that we had um, worked with to get reconnected, that we made sure had satellite phones. We had to call them every day to say, 
which medicines do you have? Which medicines do you need? Did you get your resupply? Wow. Um, you know, all, all of that stuff on a daily basis, especially in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, but that's how we worked with the worked with the chain. Um, and then kind of beyond that, partnering with some other NTOs to be able to um, make sure that the medicines that they were distributing to community health centers and the safety net clinics, um, that we were aware of what those were and that those medicines um, were being shared based on the need. So they would drop it off to, again, that central node concept of a physician in the safety net clinic and then that person would be um, kind of the holder of those medicines. So where where is Puerto Rico now? I, I, I'm seeing things on the media that seem to say the transition is happening now from response to recovery. Is that true in the health and medical area, though? I mean, how, how could we be transitioning to recovery when so much of the island is still without power? I think I think it's simply because, you know, as you guys know, that transition from response to recovery is really unclear and very blurry. Yeah. So it's easy to say, you know, well, it's it's been a while. So, <laughs> yeah. so just enough time has passed. It should have happened by now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, it's like I, I guess we still can't call it response. It's like a um, it's an impressionist painting. You just step back far enough, and it's blurry enough that it's like you know we're we're moving yeah. into. Re- Sorry, I think exactly. Nicolette, you're like, going to make it. I kind of see an elephant. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Right. <laughs> but I, I think that's exactly why. Um, in some ways, I think a lot of, you know, one of the things that I think is um, amazing about Caribbean people um, having Caribbean roots myself is that they're incredibly resilient. They know how to deal with this stuff. Um, the question of whether or not they should have to is a totally different question, but. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge how just intrinsically resilient, um, you know, these Caribbean populations are. So they're making do. They figured out how to, even with all the frustrations and just kind of the the discomfort of being in this um, this environment, they figured out how to do it for the past, what, 56 days, 58 days, something like that. Oh, God. Um, so, right, right. I mean... You know, one of the things that I um, I know is that there are a lot of private sector companies that are doing everything in their power to take care of um, their employees and doing like wraparound stuff, right? Laundry services, um, giving them places to sleep, making sure that they have water to take home to their families, giving them two bags of ice a day for the communities that surround them as well. Um, and those things are patches and they're helpful. But think about, like, also how frustrated these employees must be, right? They're happy for their jobs. They're happy that they have these things. But this is 60 days later, basically, and they're still dependent on these two bags of ice a day. So I I guess you call it recovery because at this point, having to call it a response and come face-to-face with the fact that we are still in this immediate response mode this far out is is heartbreaking i think i i don't know another word to use it's just basically it's like embarrassing to still call it response it's like wearing pajamas to like a lunch party you know do you just you don't want to do that and it it begs the question if you're still calling it a response like what else are you like what what are you responding to now that wasn't dealt with in the last 60 days well i I guess i want to at least get one more issue on the table, which is I want to ask you about something that's really important from a health and medical perspective, which is this question of the death toll. So, you know, death mm-hmm. toll for Rico, pretty low officially. Um, we've had lots of reports of, of additional bodies, um, you know, in public health. Sometimes we use this thing called excess deaths and that, that number is pretty high. We have extra bodies that are stored at the medical examiner's office. But at the same time, the government is saying that the, I think November 3rd, the mayor of San Juan, who we know, you know, is always... Um, Mm-hmm. Well, maybe we excuse when, me. No, no. <laughs> what are you about to say? Well, you know, there's that whole thing this with is the about San. To get real. The, there was the San Juan mayor, and yes. the you know, yes, it was I like the the human. You might have heard governor, that in the yes. news. Yeah. Okay. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, she said that the actual death toll may be as high as 500, mm-hmm. right? Which is a big claim, but the mm-hmm. official death statistics much lower than that. So, I guess, as a healthcare professional, what do you what do you make of this? 
So I, your point about the excess of deaths and, and how we connect and attribute um, deaths after disasters um, is is so so spot on. Um, I remember saying to my team maybe on day three of this that we will never know the full death toll. Um, I don't I don't think there's any way that we will. Um, I and I've seen a range of numbers. Um, we even wrote a blog about it, just kind of looking at the different numbers that we saw. Um, I know there's a New York Times um, article where Sherry Fink has some professors looking at statistical significance and looking at the um, reported deaths, um, I think it's a month and a half out versus this time last year to determine whether or not it's significant and could be attributed to recent events. Um, all of this is is really, um, really tricky and in some ways from my perspective not as important as understanding what those people died from. Um, any loss of life is is tragic, especially in the context of disasters. But as an infectious disease specialist, um, something that's important to me is understanding um, the the surveillance side of things, the the epidemiology. Are we asking questions about um, what these people died from? Are there you know pending threats that we should be thinking about? Um, are there infections that we may or may not be effectively tracking? Um, at this point, to me, understanding that information is a lot more important than getting an actual number right, because we're never going to get the number right. So are we getting good epi out of Puerto Rico now? Better epi. Um, I think good is a, good is a really long <laughs> Right, it's standard. a long road. It's a long road. <laughs> All we're right. We're way away from it. But um, I do know that even um, our CDC partners, um, you know, we work with the CDC very closely. We work with the Puerto Rico Department of Health as well, and we had to work with them as we were getting requests from the field that we realized were not being routed through them. Um, and we know that their capabilities have been stretched, you know, in unimaginable ways. But now we do know that the CDC folks are there, um, the Department of Health is cooperating with them. It's better, but is it good? I don't. I don't. I, I don't think so. so I mean, just, it's there's just so much. To, <laughs> there's so much catching up to to do. So much work to do. Um, yeah, it's, and just it's, there's my, a lot of challenges. From my own knowledge, do you uh, when when diseases come into an area that's been in, in, uh, uh, impacted by a, a disaster are are, are people who die from that disease, is that death attributed to the original disaster? Like, how do you, how do you determine, you know, death toll from I a disaster? I have seen it go both ways. You, you've seen it go both ways? Mm-hmm. I've, seen it, I've seen it go both ways. Um, especially for a, like a natural disaster versus a disease outbreak, right? Mm-hmm. So um, if you're thinking about like Ebola, Um, If someone in an Ebola-affected country died of Ebola, yes, attributed. Um, But if they died of malaria or um, had um, complications related to pregnancy and that happened because of the Ebola outbreak and they were not able to get into the emergency department, which was quarantined, then that was not attributed to the Ebola response, the the Ebola outbreak. Um, So... It's, it's tricky how we, how we do that. On the flip side, um, I think um, during natural disasters, it's also a question of kind of what the infectious disease is, whether or not um, surveillance happens. Sometimes cremation happens, um, and so we don't have that information. Um, and then how far out, what the infection is. So all of those things, you know, vary um, whether or not that happens or not. Yeah, it's the, you know, there's because I love talking about death count, so that's a great subject <laughs> right. to close on, right? right? But there is this idea of natural disaster of it's excess death. Bombs, but I think it's only fair. Yeah. Well, bo- from bombs, bombs to often death. lead to excess death counts. It turns out, and you do you go back after a disaster and you rerun all the death stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And you look at what mm-hmm. your excess counts were. This is what I think Sherry Fink was trying to do in the Times, but you need a lot of right. data and you need a very specific account of the medical examiners of each one to really right. attribute it. Which in disaster areas you don't. 
often have, right? Yeah. Because it's been impacted by exactly. the I guess it's safe to say from my point of view, it does seem like from the initial excess death numbers that our, that the death toll is likely closer to 500 than 50, yeah. you know? Um, but, you know, mm-hmm. that's just me speculating. It uh, makes sense. I've seen numbers as high as 800. Wow. All right. Well, there you go. Um, You're just, well, I, I thought I, I was like I speculating think... wildly and Nicolette just No, I don't. Off. No, you know what? I don't think you're speculating at all because we also have to remember how far out from the event we're talking, right? So if we're talking, I, I mean, you know, not to, to conflate two unrelated things, but let's think about the death impacts after Irma in the absence of air conditioning in 80-something degree heat for, you know, a, a short period of time. Now we're talking about Puerto Rico, absence of power or consistent power, um, for a much longer period of time. Yeah. I think, you know, at this point, I was thinking about it today, pretty much everyone should be considered a vulnerable population in Puerto Rico right now. There is no idea, you know, no concept of really just having a small population of medically fragile individuals or vulnerable populations. Like, everyone in that environment is going to need more care. So it if that holds, then it reasons that, you know, on a population as large as Puerto Rico's, that that is that could the pop the death toll could be higher. I do want to point out though that we're also not talking enough about the Virgin Islands. Um, it's really important to think not just about the healthcare in Puerto Rico, but the healthcare in the US Virgin Islands where all of the hospitals were wiped out. Yeah. All of them. And we haven't even So Yeah, that's yeah, it's like there's just we. I mean, we, we had patients that we knew were, um, you know, HHS had medically evacuated, and we worked with them, you know, just supporting them once they got here. And the caregivers that evacuated with the patients needed care. Some of the caregivers had ten comorbidities. So imagine, you know, those are just the people who were evacuated because they were attached to or, you know, um, related to someone that needed critical dialysis. So who else is on the island? Wow. (laughs) You know, we are such loudmouths. And like as much as we talk, we just cannot talk enough to cover all of the bad stuff that's happening right. this year. I, you know, one thing that's core in disaster research is this idea of disasters are logarithmic. Like if your response is a certain length of time, your recovery period is going to be like 10 times as long. And then your long-term recovery period is 10 times as long as that. And based on those statistics, I feel like it's going to be like 30 years before the Caribbean recovers from all this stuff. Certainly FEMA is going to yeah. be there a decade, right? Right. That's right. People, those at least, se- at the, least, those yeah. seasoned emergency managers will basically grow old and die in the EOC there in uh, Puerto Rico. By the time, you know, the, re- the reality is by the time Maria reco- true recovery is underway, there will be another storm. I don't know. Is it Linus from Peanuts that always has like the gray cloud over its head? <laughs> no, oh, no. no. <laughs> that Pigpin? Linus, no. Has the blanket. Linus has the blanket. Pigpin has the dust That's cloud. Bad. Is that is that yes. same yes. as the rain cloud? Yes, that's it. That's cloud? it. We... I don't know, but yeah, you're basically right. So we're all pig pen <laughs> right now for the next uh, <laughs> right. until the climate cycles change. Basically, we're all pig pen. Right until the next blizzard. exactly. Yes. <laughs> One thing we like to do with all of our guests is have a final lightning round. I'm sure you've heard about it in your PhD studies, but um, so are you, are you ready to experience? That's right. It's taught at hazards? Oxford now. <laughs> lightning round. I'm going to take that as a yes. Sure. Okay. Sure. Let's do it. <laughs> uh, so, what is your favorite hazard? Uh, I, I, you know, I, I did HIV pharmacology. I love a good infectious disease outbreak. Nice. Oh, yeah. Don't we all? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, you want me to ask the next yeah, one? We're, we're... I, I don't have it in front. Okay, okay. Here we go. So slightly different. What's the hazard that scares you the most? Nuclear event. Um, mm, that's yeah. a good one. Mm-hmm. Any day now. Any day. I buy my parents' potassium iodide every okay. quarter. Whoa. <laughs> but it doesn't expire for like four years. Why do you, why do you keep buying I them know, new they, stuff? They, so – I, they live in New York City, one, and I know my mother too. You got neighbors, so, so. So. It just just spread it around. They could be like sure. crack dealers, and yeah. afterwards, because 
that's exactly what would happen is they would be like, oh, no, all of these other people in Brooklyn need it more than we do. So, <laughs> Well, aren't they? They got to be over just, like 20, right? You don't, Your parents aren't like 20 years old. So, you know, come on. No. <laughs> they don't really need KI. They're, you know, their iodide levels are totally yeah, like saturated. Kids, right? <laughs> okay, moving on. Uh, what is the first disaster that you remember? Um... Not that you were, Remem- but that you remember. Yeah. Re- remember well might be Hurricane Andrew. Oh, that's a good one. Or George. One of those that wiped it wiped out a part a big part of um Jamaica and a lot of my family was um was there mm. and affected. So what's the first major disaster you worked? Mm, Haiti earthquake. Oh, oh wow. Oh that's, yeah, we should talk about yeah. that sometime. Yeah. yeah. That'd be a good future episode uh what is your dream emergency management job or you could see you know healthcare readiness job feel free to you know disaster related job what's your dream disaster related job um sitting in an ivory tower somewhere talking about all of the disasters that happened before because i don't have to manage anymore i don't know if there's a title for that but like it means you're seasoned I, you're seasoned when you can just I, sit in the I'm tower totally and okay with like i i'm one of those people who really believes in putting myself out of business so i'm totally okay with like us doing such a great job that we just need to go find another problem it's not looking good, Nicolette. That's I'm just going to let you know. This know. year. <laughs> but you're right. That should be the goal of every emergency manager, that you work yourself out of a job. There's everybody so prepared. You're not <laughs> anymore. Favorite disaster movie. Go. What's your favorite disaster movie? Oh, man. Um, what is that movie with Will Smith? Is it I Am Legend? Oh, that's oh, a good. That yeah. I'm telling you, I love infectious diseases. <laughs> that is so sad, though. That's like he's just he has the dog, and then spoiler, the dog dies. It's just it's. I know, but there's a centrifuge. There's an ultra centrifuge. That's he's micro petting. It's kind of awesome. Oh yeah, micro pipe. That's always one of my bulwarks for a good movie is micro If there's micro pipettes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um. So what is, what's your favorite chemical? Silicon. No. And why is that? Yeah. Come on. You don't even know what silicon um, is. I do too. <laughs> Shut up, bitch. Flammability is pretty cool. And the fact that it's one of the elements that completely changes um, depending on what it's in. So whether it's in a matrix or actually just like silicate, it's just totally different. I think it's cool. I don't know. I I'm gonna then ask the word. What's your what's the chemical you you hate the most? What's the worst chemical? What's the worst um, chemical? <laughs> so this one is actually a drug, and I just need to say, Gilead, you guys are awesome. Um, tenofovir, because I had to study tenofovir for my dissertation, and I'm just. I'm still tired of that drug. Um, so, so I have like no, I don't know what, thing. what you got to give me a, yeah, what is it? What so is tenofovir? Tenofovir is, um, it's a Gilead form, formulated drug, um, but it is an HIV treatment drug. Um, it's a first line med. Um, and we actually, part of my dissertation was actually really cool in, in my opinion, because <laughs> it showed that you could use a drug to tr- to prevent the transmission of HIV. Oh, this is the and it showed drug. how that worked. Wow. What's the brand name of that? Or... So it's tenofovir. Yeah, but there's a prep. We it's... okay. It's like the 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 prep drug that they talk about now. That the, all the yeah. Same... Okay. So, okay. I don't, I don't know what they call it now, but um. So I know that they're still working on creating it. Um, creating it in a few different formulations. Um, looking at like vaginal films and um, enema formulations and things of that nature, but um, I, I worked with that single mo- molecule so much. I'm I'm just you're over you're it. over you're it. over <laughs> the single molecule. I'm, I'm yeah, over me it. too. Yeah, yeah, me too. I yeah, yeah. It's uh-huh. stupid. Yeah, if you liked it, you should have put a ring on it. No, I don't like the single molecule. <laughs> so, all right, last question. What's the f- what's your favorite item that's in your go bag? Don't say Tomasavir. My Mophie. Sorry. No, my Mitch, Mophie. What's Mophie? My Mophie. It's the so it's the portable charger. Oh. Um, but mine is like on steroids, so it has like seven ports in it. Oh, that's awesome. 
That's actually awesome. Yeah. Let's let, we're going to add that to the official Dukes of Hazards go kit as soon as we make it. I think that's like a genius thing. <laughs> and sell it, right? Yeah, that's right. That's, that's right. Thing. So cool. It can charge like three iPads and like six cell phones. That's great. That's a must a must have, definitely. Yeah. Well, Nicolette, thank you so much for being on the podcast. You have elevated our game <laughs> infinitely. <laughs> we now know more about chemicals than we ever I, thought than possible. I ever had embalm making. That's right. That's uh, right. <laughs> if if people want to connect with you or, or follow what you're doing, is is Twitter the best way? Absolutely. Um, Twitter. So the healthcare ready Twitter is HC underscore ready. Um, my Twitter is N Lewis Saint underscore PhD. Um, or just go to our website. We have um, we have our phone numbers and um, our our yeah two of our emails on there so you want to work with us or have more questions feel free to reach out to us either way and we very much enjoy your twitter feed you're very active on twitter and it's also always a learning experience just following you on twitter so uh we both enjoy that thanks so much nicolette thanks. And i hope my wrestling messages aren't too weird but you know <laughs> big wrestling fan <laughs> and thanks for everything that you've done for for uh texas for puerto rico for the entire caribbean and everything in this uh, season of disasters Thank you. Well, that was a great episode. Thanks so much for Nicolette Lewis Saint joining us. It was a good discussion. We always run out of time. There's there's so much. There's more so much responses. bad stuff to talk about, man. And she was she was great. I feel like I'm like intellectually exhausted after that. You and know that, what I mean? You know that was one. As it was like the healthcare aspect of this response. Yeah. There's so many more. It's all over the place. It really is. Um, And I just, you know, best wishes to all of you guys who I know are still, there are thousands of people still in Puerto Rico working this job in so many different ways. God bless FEMA. That should be our tagline this year, I think, (laughs) for this podcast because they are stretched thin and in every place. Um, So if you would like to ask us a question, if you want to see us hear us see us talk about if you were in here talking about drugs more or bombs making, drugs or bombs uh tweet at us at hazards podcast you can go on our facebook page uh you can call us and leave us a voicemail 859-429-2731 oh my god we've gotten like four calls that we haven't answered in any way we have no I mean, why aren't i getting these voicemails? i don't know because i'm like checking this line? It, i just keep forgetting to tell but really thank you for calling us Great. and i'll we try and send to those to day. andrew i'm sorry yes. andrew that's thank my fault. you yeah. thanks for listening follow us on twitter we love you that's Stay right safe. and uh everybody at iem you guys we're jealous fun. that I'm you're there so jealous yeah you guys uh rock and roll <laughs> i'm sorry about the phone call I'm just, yeah, I sound like I'm live. That's right. The lives are jammed. If you'd like to give us $5 a month for our ongoing hazards coverage, 